Summary of the Coquette by Hannah Webster Foster Mr. Halley, who was engaged to Eliza Wharton, died not long ago. Her late father had promised Eliza's hand to Mr. Halley, a preacher who was several years older than she was. She agreed to marry him out of implicit obedience to the will and desires of her parents. Not long after they got engaged, Mr. Halley got sick. Even though they never got married, Eliza took care of him until he died. She didn't love him, but she liked him, and now that she is free from her duty, she is relieved and happy. Eliza doesn't like the oppressive ideas of women in America after the revolution, and she doesn't want to get married or start a family. Eliza is a lively, happy woman with a naturally gay disposition, and she likes to flirt. Eliza thinks marriage is limiting, and she calls it the tomb of friendship. This is especially sad for her because friendship is the most important thing in her life. She wants to meet new people and date several guys, but she doesn't want to get married for as long as possible. Eliza meets two very different men while she is staying with her good friends General and Mrs. Richman, Reverend Boyer a serious and respectable preacher, and Major Sanford, a rich and stylish man who admits to being a libertine and rake. Reverend Boyer is the kind of guy that society and Eliza's friends think she should marry. He is honest and good, but he is not very interesting and lives a cheap life. On the other hand, Sanford is interesting and charming, and he has a lot of money. Eliza has wanted to be in the top class for most of her life and a marriage to Sanford could make that happen. Sanford's image, on the other hand, isn't very good, and he doesn't see Eliza as anything more than a possible notch in his belt. Eliza's friends don't like Sanford, and they are too hard on her for flirting with him and being clearly interested in him. Even though Mrs. Richmond keeps telling Eliza to accept Reverend Boyer's approaches, Eliza tells her friends and the two men in her life that she will not be tied down to either of them. Boyer and Sanford don't care that Eliza wants to stay single in the late 1700s. Instead, they both try to get her attention. Boyer starts to like her and keeps putting pressure on her to get married. Sanford doesn't want to marry her because, like Eliza, he thinks marriage is limiting and hard. After all, Eliza doesn't have any money and Sanford has spent all of his. If he ever gets married, it will be to a woman with a lot of money who can keep him living the way he is used to. Even though Sanford doesn't want to marry Eliza, he doesn't want her to be with anyone else, and he promises to ruin her relationship with Reverend Boyer. Eliza's friends keep telling her to marry Boyer, even though she has asked them to stay out of her love life, and they publicly criticize her feelings for Sanford. Soon, Eliza's friends and their conservative society wear her down, and she agrees to marry Boyer, but she won't give him a date. Boyer gets tired of waiting for her, and the more he sees of her with Sanford, the more he thinks something is wrong. Boyer finally leaves Eliza for good when he finds her talking with Sanford in the yard. Boyer sends Eliza a harsh letter after he breaks up with her. He says that he is not writing as a lover but as an uninterested friend, and like Eliza's other friends, he makes fun of and insults her. He makes it sound like she lacks morality and morals and that her coquettish behavior is beneath his honor. He tells her that her relationship with Sanford is wrong, and then he goes to Hampshire to take his final vows as a priest and serve a local church. Eliza is left crushed. She met with Sanford in the garden just to tell him that she was going to marry Boyer and couldn't see him anymore, but Boyer won't listen to her reasoning. Boyer is finally the one for Eliza, but it's too late. Sanford also leaves and goes south, and Eliza soon hears that he is going to marry a rich southern woman. When Eliza is left alone without either man, she falls into a deep sadness and her health starts to get worse. She starts to lose weight and makes vague comments about being tired and having headaches. She also stops going out with friends and family. Mrs. Richmond tells Eliza to write Boyer for peace of mind, so she does, hoping to rekindle the flame of their old relationship. Boyer is nice, but he is still aloof and critical, and he has a new virtuous wife. Eliza's physical and mental health keep getting worse, and Sanford and his new wife, Nancy, move back to town. Sanford gets back in touch with Eliza right away and tells her to spend time with his wife. Eliza accepts, 
and she seems to come out of her depression for a short time, but it isn't long before she goes back to being a recluse. Julia Granby, Eliza's friend, comes to stay with her to cheer her up, but Eliza is too sad for her to help. Eliza's relationship with Sanford and her flirty ways are also judged and criticized by Julia, who often makes Eliza feel worse. Sanford keeps chasing after Eliza and does nothing to hide it from his wife. Soon, he is able to seduce her. She gets pregnant and keeps it from her friends and family, but Julia finds her sneaking out in the middle of the night to meet Sanford. She tells Julia about the affair and begs for her forgiveness, but Julia is cold and cruel. Julia tells Eliza, you went against knowledge and reason, against warnings and advice. Your friends will be reluctant to forgive you because you have lost their favor. Eliza leaves town in the middle of the night because her name is ruined. Sanford takes her to a country inn in Danvers, Massachusetts, and gets her a room there. When Sanford goes home, he doesn't see Eliza again. Soon, Nancy and Sanford get a divorce, which leaves him homeless and poor, and Eliza gives birth to a baby alone at the inn. The baby dies right away. Eliza dies soon after, most likely from tuberculosis, because she had become a reproach and disgrace to her friends. About the author. In 1758, Hannah Webster was born in the Massachusetts town of Salisbury. We don't know much about her life, but we do know that her father was a rich merchant and that her mother died when she was only four years old. As a child, she went to private school and learned a lot. Foster started writing political pieces for a Boston newspaper around 1770. She is known as the first woman in the newly independent United States to say she was a feminist and do something about it. She married Rev. John Foster, a well-known priest, in 1785, and the couple moved to Brighton, Massachusetts, where he took over the church services. After they had six kids together, Foster started writing. In 1797, she wrote The Coquette, which was based on the real-life death of Elizabeth Whitman, a single woman who died at an inn in Danvers, Massachusetts, after giving birth alone. The scandalous story of Elizabeth Whitman quickly spread across the country and became a well-known warning about the risks of being immoral. Foster put out her book under the name A Lady of Massachusetts, but it was a huge hit right away. Foster's book The Coquette stayed famous for the rest of his life, and it is said that only the Bible was read more in America in the late 18th century. Foster's second book, The Boarding School, or Lessons of a Preceptress to Her Pupils, was released in 1798. It was about how women were educated in early America, but it wasn't nearly as popular as The Coquette. Foster's husband died in 1829, so she went to Canada to live with her daughter in Montreal, Quebec. Foster, a well-known author and supporter of women's rights, died there at the age of 81. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.